recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to today's Implementation Science webinar. We are excited to be joined by our speakers, but before we get started, a brief word about logistics. All lines are in listen-only mode. We ask that if you are not already on mute, to please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As mentioned, this session is being recorded and muting all lines will help us to avoid any background noise. We encourage questions and comments. Questions can be submitted by using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question into the provided Q&A field and hit submit. Feel free to submit your questions at any time during today's call. We will be using the chat panel to share resources throughout today's talk. Note, you may need to activate the appropriate panel using the menu options found on the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we recommend navigating to the view menu at the top of your screen and selecting hide non-video participants, as this will give you the best glimpse at our great speakers. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. David? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and uh, thanks so much to everybody for joining. It looks like a, a really uh, awesome, a vibrant, and a, and a large audience uh, for what we know is going to be an excellent presentation. You see uh, the smiling faces that you're that we'll all have a chance to learn uh, from uh, over the next uh, 90 minutes. Uh, so just to put this in a broader context, for those of you who haven't joined on a previous uh, implementation science webinar series. We typically have these monthly opportunities uh, to really both learn from our experts within the field and also to establish dialogues around where the field needs to move forward. And so for implementation science, thanks to our special advisor for health equity and implementation science, April O, uh, we've really been trying to think through how do we make a much better use of, of the methods, of the theories, of the concepts of implementation science along with health equity to do better by our ultimate goal, which is, for us at NCI is to try and reduce the burden of cancer for everybody. Uh, and so we've engaged in the developing of what is a, a three-part webinar series to really unpack how implementation science and health equity can come together. Uh, for those of you who, in, uh, who joined us a number of weeks ago, uh, we had an initial discussion that was around framing priorities for advancing health equity through implementation science. Uh, and that was a great opportunity to learn from another set of experts. And there was a lot of discussion around uh, how, do we, how do we really think about broader social determinants of health? Uh, how do we think through some of the ways in which we design our studies or involve different key stakeholders uh, across the whole uh, process of, of conducting, of developing, of conducting, and, and then thinking about the implications of our studies. Uh, and then this, uh, what really came up as part of that discussion was how really important it is for us to unpack um, much more around, uh, around structural racism, around social determinants of health. And so we're so excited uh, to have these uh, contributors, these great experts with us today. Um, so I'm excited to be able to take a step back and just listen because I know how much I have to learn. Uh, we really do appreciate all of the work that you all do uh, when you're not listening uh, to these webinars. Uh, and together we feel very confident that we can do better uh, by us all uh, going forward. So with that said, I want to turn things over to uh, April uh, to uh, orient us and, and, and kick off this wonderful webinar. And thanks again so much. Great. Thanks so much, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. I know that there's so much going on these days and also living in a pandemic. So the fact that you've chosen to join us for this webinar uh, means a lot to us. So thank you for sharing your time. And I hope all of you are doing well at home or work or wherever you may be. Um, it's my um, great honor and privilege to be able to host this conversation um, with a uh, great panel of colleagues and friends. Um, I wanted to uh, start off first just introducing everyone and, um, and their expertise and, and where they are. Um, so first we have, um, as you can see on, on our screen, uh, we have Dr. Valerie Bluebird Jernigan, and she's a professor of, of rural health and executive director for the Center for Indigenous Health Research and Policy at the Oklahoma State University. We also have uh, Dr. Gilbert G, um, who is a professor for, in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we have Dr. Derek Griffith, um, who is professor um, in the Health Systems Administration and in Oncology at the Lombardi Can Comprehensive Cancer Center, and is also founding co-director of the Georgetown Racial Justice Institute 
and founder and director of the Center for Men's Health Equity at the Racial Justice Institute at Georgetown. Hi, Derek, thanks for joining us. Um, and we also have uh, Rachel Shelton, who is an associate professor for socio in sociomedical sciences at Columbia University. Um, hi, Rachel, thanks for joining. Um, what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna ask a series of questions to our esteemed panelists, and then we're gonna have some time for Q&A. So I invite all of you to actively use the chat and send your questions and we'll try to get through as much of them as possible. And I also invite our panelists to ask questions of themselves. Um, these are uh, scholars, researchers, practitioners who have been working in this space for quite some time. And I also want to acknowledge that as uh, myself, as a woman of color um, and our, our panelists who are composed of people of color, as well as allies, um, that this is a, a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts. And um, we're very passionate about this. This is also work that we're doing in our scholarship and looking for ways to advance health equity uh, through implementation science. So with that, I will go ahead and, and get started with our panel. Thanks again, everyone, and thank you for joining us. So before we start off, I think that what would be great is if we could go through and hear a little bit about all of you. Um, so I'll go through the panel and just ask if you could please share a bit about yourself and how you became interested in health equity, social determinants of health, and implementation science research and if you don't mind also sharing a little bit of what you focused on in your research to, by way of background. Um, so I'll kick it off um, first with uh, Dr. Rachel Shelton. Thanks so much, April, and I'm so honored to be on this panel today. Great to see you all here. So, you know, health equity has really been a common thread in my career in public health over the past 20 years. And there really were some formative experiences in my training early on that shaped a specific focus on structural racism and social determinants of health. So I did my master's of public health and the training program I attended at UNC had a really strong focus on community based participatory research. And I really see CBPR as being really critical founding and grounding for all the work that I do in health equity. And that's been a common thread throughout my research career. Um, and really, I had the opportunity in community forums to learn from, through qualitative work, the experiences of communities in terms of structural racism, in terms of immigration policies, in terms of social factors that shape their health. And that really impacted me. Um, and I decided I wanted to take that thread further. So I went to get my doctorate um, at Harvard School of Public Health, specifically because they had a very strong focus on social epidemiology. And scholars like Nancy Krieger were doing amazing work on racism and health. At that time, I, uh, I transitioned to cancer prevention and screening. And at that time, there was a lot of work on individual and interpersonal influences on screening. And my dissertation work, I really wanted to broaden the social context through which we understand inequities in cancer screening. So I did a lot of mixed methods work to try and contextualize that and understand how factors like racism, medical mistrust, social networks really intersect to impact these patterns and inequities. And I focused a lot and partnered a lot with um, black women uh, in particular. So I continued that, um, that path, you know, I have continued to have some grants funded and ROIs focused on looking at racism and health, but I started to really, as I transitioned to faculty, I wanted to do more that would have impact. I wanted to see the impact beyond describing it. So I started to do work thinking about, are there interventions that are already out there that are addressing some of these social determinants? Are there ones that already are addressing some of these huge racial inequities? Um, and I started doing work with peer led community lay health advisor programs, because these women are from the community, they experience the social context, the structural determinants, and they are empowered and leaders who help engage um, and transform their communities to promote health. So this was very appealing to me, and I started partnering with a group of African American cancer survivors um, around these issues from the National Witness Project, who had already successfully implemented a program for over you know, 15 years. Um, and as I started working with them, I started learning the challenges they were having in real world community settings around sustaining 
their evidence-based program that had such an impact on these inequities. So that really brought me to implementation science to ask these questions. How can we actually sustain and support evidence-based programs that are developed by and for the community that we know impact structural determinants and improve health inequities? That's really driven a lot of my work and our partnership over the past you know, 10 to 12 years has shaped a lot of my questions and considerations around this intersection of health equity um, and implementation science. So that's kind of, some of my story of why I'm here and what's kind of brought me to this work. And I think really the intersection of my work and my interests are how can we bring a stronger equity lens that's really critical um, to our field to promote health equity um, in a way that's meaningful, that has impact um, to the communities that we're working with. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Rachel. So it sounds like scholarship seeking to make change and, and really advance equity. Um, let's see. So, Valerie, would you mind also sharing a bit about your background and what brought you to this space in social determinants and equity? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. It's quite an honor to be here and it's a privilege to be on this panel with colleagues and friends. Um, I am an implementation scientist. I'm an interventionist. I originally got started in this work, I think in large part because of my own personal experiences, having been, you know, raised in rural Oklahoma and really seeing sort of some of the systems that were in place with Native American communities particularly the Indian Health Service that just was really underfunded and did not um, was not able to provide comprehensive health care in the ways that Native communities needed. And so that triggered a lot of curiosity in me about why these inequities existed and drew me into public health. I was trained in very traditional scientific research and realized that the voices missing at the table were really the communities that were most impacted by the issues we were discussing. So I started down a career in community-based participatory research and my focus has been on food systems and the ways that food systems create disparities in Native American communities. And when I first learned about implementation science, I was thrilled that this existed and it was a thing because it's pragmatic and it's learning by doing. And that's really consistent with indigenous ways of knowing and it's consistent with a community-based participatory research approach that really values lay knowledge. And so I got very excited about implementation science and attended every training that I could. And at that time, it's still a relatively new discipline, but at that time, none of my colleagues were really doing this. And I remember hearing some of my colleagues say, isn't that what old doctors do in hospitals? And it really, I'd, I'd show them some of the articles and they were like, wow, this is really exciting. This is really great. And um, for a while, I think I was an implementation science preacher or something and just went around the country talking about how exciting it was. And, and, I, and I really do enjoy studying how we do things and telling the story of our interventions. So that's probably how um, I got started down this path. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that, Valerie. I think what I'm hearing too is that IS can be used and you found that it can be really used as a tool to advance equity and brings in so many different um, disciplines and perspectives, including of the communities that we serve. Um, so I'd like to ask Derek if you could give um, a little bit of background about yourself as well in terms of how you became interested in equity, social determinants of health, and what you, you focused on in your areas of research. Sure. Um, let me first say, you know, thank you for inviting me, and it is truly an honor to be on this panel with so many 
um, I won't call them old, but old friends and, and colleagues and so forth that I've known for a very long time. Um, I got started in this um, actually in a bit of a non-traditional way because my undergrad degrees were in psychology and African-American studies. And then my PhD is actually in community psych clinical and community psychology. So this, um, and then I did a postdoc in uh, community-based participatory health disparities research uh, through the Kellogg um, Community Health Scholars Program. And so through all of those sort of things, one of the themes was the focus on community, the power of community, the need to anchor knowledge and experience in that of community and to share power with the community in defining what those issues were and in understanding um, the factors that influenced broadly health and well-being. Um, the other part of that for me was in my, my dissertation actually focused on the development of social activists. And so I got really fascinated with how do we understand how people make sense of the world, the social and political world that they live in, and basically come up with better ways to address, understand and address their sort of larger context. As I moved from, so that gave me um, also a very much of a historical sort of sense of, of things. And so I often look to history and sort of the historical context in addition to sort of our contemporary context to really make sense of a lot of the issues that I now study. Um, as part of my postdoc, I, in, and in, in community psychology and psychology in general, you know, we don't, we typically have not dealt with as hard of outcomes, if you will, as who lives, who dies, who gets sick and so forth. Um, psychology, at least in the way that I was practicing it, and trained was, you know, we focused much more on what in public health would be sort of more intermediate or moderating outcomes, mediating outcomes, like, um, well, you know, in things that that we don't sort of measure without getting off into that, don't we measure that we don't measure quite as as concretely in in health. And so I was fascinated with that and sort of was really interested in in public health, moved from doing initially HIV prevention work to in my postdoc did two projects. One was on um, trying to understand the social and historical context of black men's um, prostate cancer risk in a rural community. And then also working with a local health department on a project called Dismantling Racism to try to understand how we could better address racism as a social determinant of the, care, of the, the services that they provided to their local, local catchment area, as well as how could we change um, the people who worked in the health department as a way to address those kind of broader issues. And so that foundation has sort of taken me into really looking at organizational factors as it relates to issues of race, really focusing on institutional racism. By that, I mean sort of looking at it within the organizational institutional context and structural racism being sort of the links between or the umbrella that cuts across those kind of institutions. Um, the cancer work has really always stayed a, a primary focus of mine. I do mostly cancer prevention work as it relates to black men and black men's health, which is where the men's health equity focus comes in. And a lot of the implementation science, I honestly just get to, to do as I hang out with April and, and Rachel, I get to play one sort of a proxy and my colleague. Um, but the, the training in community psychology is very consistent with the focus on um, trying to understand how best do we develop, evaluate these kinds of programs and a really strong focus on particularly process evaluation. How do we make sense of those factors? And so I've done a lot of qualitative work to try to understand how people experience these issues and how do we need to integrate that into programs as well. Great. Thanks so much, Derek. Um, all right, so and and Derek, by the way, I'm giving you your implementation science card because I think that we've done so much work together. And so one of the great, um, you know, great things about implementation science is I think it's so transdisciplinary and we can only do the good work that we do by bringing in these different disciplinary perspectives. And so that makes the work really, really rich. Um, so well, thanks thank for you. sharing that. Um, and your, and your uh, background. Uh, so Gilbert, if you could also please introduce yourself and your background and what you focused on in your research. Sure. Um, yeah, so thank you for the invite. It's amazing to be here with such a amazing channel and you know, just to share some thoughts with all of you. Um, yeah, so I'm a little bit of an oddball because you know, I'm like 
I'm quite different in the sense that, uh, you know, many of you are smart and purposeful in designing your careers. And for me, my trajectory has really been a series of happy accidents. You know, I uh, left Los Angeles to go to college at Oberlin, um, you know, some years ago, because I essentially wanted to find a small liberal arts school that was strong in English and sciences, because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and I wanted to be away from Los Angeles. And when I got there, I realized that there was a strong part of me that sort of had a latent, you know, social activist uh, that I didn't know about, but, you know, kind of going there where my positionality as an Asian American was certainly challenged that the assumptions I had in LA didn't hold in Ohio where we would just be stared at when we would just go to buy pie, um, you know, or cake or whatever it was, you know, just down the road. But at that time, you know, I bounced around a bunch of majors. Um, and incidentally, I got to Oberlin because they sent me junk mail as a junior high school student that I was just, hey, it's away from LA, it's liberal arts, it's meets a bunch of my check boxes. Um, so when I got to Oberlin, I bounced around a bunch of majors. Um, I ended up as a neuroscience major. And I thought I wanted to do work on circadian rhythms and become a neuroscientist. But along the way, I got junk mail from a couple of schools of public health, including Johns Hopkins. And so I applied because they waived my application fee because I was low income. And I thought, oh, well, you know, what the heck? Um, and, and then I thought, well, there's no way I'm gonna get into Hopkins because I'm kind of like a B plus E kind of student and, you know, I'm just okay. Um, and next thing, and I thought, well, you know, I, I can't, I'm not ready to go and do a doctorate in neuroscience, so, and I'm not going to get into Hopkins, so I'll just go to the Bay Area and do some community organizing with my friends who are going to do that too. And then I got in, and I was like, oh, what the heck? I might as well go. And I get to Hopkins, and I'm lost because, you know, it was, I was there by accident, right? Just junk mail. I wasn't doing my research on, you know, schools and, and whatnot. And this is in the 90s. Um, so it's a very different context today in terms of thinking about health equity. Um, so I was bouncing around, I didn't know what to do. And one day my uh, uh, mentor, Jeff Johnson said to me, he goes, Bill, why don't you give a, why don't you give a talk to the MPH class on uh, race and health? And I thought, oh, um, okay. And he knew I had an interest in this and he, kind of, he probably knew before I knew. And I was freaking out because, because here I am, I'm a 22 year old guy who wore a Snoopy t-shirt and ripped up blue jeans. And I'm talking to the MPH class at Hopkins, which is, you know, people who have MDs or surgeons, lawyers, Peace Corps, et cetera, you know, older, more experienced than me. And I thought, what in the world am I gonna do for this? So I spent a month preparing this 60 minute lecture on race and health and documenting that there are you know, differences in health um, was not a problem. But in the 1990s, there was really no framework to really think about what explains this. You know, there wasn't that much there. You know, there were some kind of discussions that, well, race is really an issue of class and you're all barking up the wrong tree. Uh, there were some people talking about culture, some people talking about genetics and healthcare access and so forth. And, you know, this is the rise of, or when, you know, the Clintons were trying to push through their healthcare legislation. And as I thought about, well, you know, what do I do with this lecture? How do I explain it? And I went through culture, genetics, social class, none of those made sense to me. The only thing that made sense to me was this history of structural oppression that glued together the experiences of people of color across the nation's history. And so it was then, and there's only a handful of people, a handful of studies uh, they were even talking about this, but that was really what made sense to me. So I threw it in a lecture. Um, and from there, it really kind of sparked this journey that I've had over the last 20 years, uh, or probably more. I think I was really lucky because I think a lot, at that time, you know, a lot of people were saying, well, why don't you do Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, you're interested in you know, minority groups, but you should really be studying social class because it's really the wrong phenomenon. Uh, but luckily for me, I had a few people that, you know, I could look to like Tom Ruiz, you know, who wrote a, for me, a very influential paper on, you know, dummy variables, you know, and race. 
Uh, and it just made really, really made me really think about what assumptions we're making. And so, um, and I was lucky in the sense that, you know, I was also interested in pursuing this topic with Asian Americans. And to think about first, thinking about racism and health in the 1990s as a grad student, that you're kind of dumb to pursue this in the first place. You should be studying something else that you can get a job in. And then to be even dumber to really focus on Asian Americans for consider model minority group, it, it was almost kind of insane in a sense. And I was just lucky that my committee was supportive and said, go, go ahead, we're not gonna stand in your way, but you gotta do your thing, do good science, you know, make the arguments and so forth. Um, and so from then on, uh, it's just this, been this journey of, you know, trying to understand those basic questions a little bit deeper and further, learning a lot from the various communities um, I had the opportunity to bump into and who have shared wisdom and, you know, pushed me and asked the tough questions. Uh, and so here I am today. So that's where I am. Great. Thank you for that. And who knew that junk mail could really have such a strong impact on someone's career? <laughs> Yeah, those uh, those cards did, did a trick. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you all for um, sharing a little bit about yourselves and what brought you um, to this point in your careers as we're thinking about advancing health equity. So, you know, one of the things that as we were preparing for this conversation, uh, the group of us got together and initially I was thinking, let's focus on, on on really how we can bring the social determinants into the work that we're doing in implementation science. Implementation science is a tool that can really advance action um, towards ad advancing equity. Um, but you know, this panel, and this is the right panel, and I love the expertise that we have here because they they pushed me to think about how we're framing this. And this is this brings us to uh, my next question, and that's that structural racism is a structural and social determinant of health, but it is also a driving factor, a driving force in equity, and particularly for communities of color and communities that have been historically marginalized. This is the lens through which, and it's the system that influences housing, food systems that Valerie works in, uh, education, transportation, and of course, health. Um, so I am wondering if our panelists, if Derek and, and um, Gilbert, if you could please share some of your reflections on some of the key approaches and areas of research and practice that we can expand in implementation science. What can we do to expand to be able to leverage and dismantle structural racism? How can we start to not just measure it um, and look at its impacts, but actually start to make some changes um, so that we can reduce the impact of its negative impacts on health and also its influences on these multiple other systems in which our communities live, work, and play. Um, so maybe, um, uh, Derek, if you could start off, please. Sure, I'm happy to. I mean, I think the, the first thing I would note is kind of building off of what Gil said. I mean, this is a very contested notion. It has been historically that racism is a determinant of health, that racism can be talked about in a scientific context that it actually even is relevant and in, um, into our in our scientific you know lexicon um, from 25 years ago when David Williams was at least one of the first if not the first to put that into scientific papers and to talk about these issues um, and we still see it very hotly contested now that there's a, a strong effort to push this back out of our sort of more our larger sort of conversation in media and certainly within our science. So I don't want to start with the assumption that everybody sort of agrees with this idea that racism, structural racism is even relevant to thinking about the, the core and fundamental determinants of health. Having said that, I think the next part that, that for me is also striking is what's the goal? You know, is the goal, and I don't think we, you know, again, these things are kind of taken for granted that we assume that we agree on what equity means, but does equity really mean that we're actually achieving and sustaining the same outcomes for groups over time? And we never sort of defined how much time and, and those kind of factors. 
we never necessarily agreed that we're talking about outcomes. Um, a lot of the language, particularly some of the changes that have happened with healthy people and related sort of documents have more focused on if we can equalize the opportunities for people to be healthy, we need to take our attention essentially away from focusing on the outcomes. So I think all of that very much influences implementation science and how we even think about this work. Um, one of the things that, um, frankly, you and, and Rachel and I have been chatting about quite a bit and, and our other colleagues um, in doing some work together has been the role of um, how do we help people think about their work? And the assumption for a lot of the anti-racism work, organizing and so forth done by groups like Racial Equity Institute and others um, really does focus on or basically has the assumption that people are really committed to doing the work to change themselves. And again, that's an assumption that we can't necessarily make and that certainly in this particular day and time is not necessarily universally agreed on. Um, our work is you know, often things that we separate from ourselves. So this idea that you're going to put so much energy into developing and being reflexive in your scholarship, being reflexive in your work, thinking about the implications, the assumptions that you're making, challenging those to make sure that you actually have evidence for thinking about determinants of health in a particular way, thinking about how you explain patterns of health for specific groups is not something that everybody has necessarily committed to. But that is, for me, one of the core places that we um, have to focus. The last quick thing I'll say is that that idea is very much baked into our institutional structures. So it's, you know, if you're really focused on developing a career, really trying to think about interventions to address structural racism, that still is, while it's a very laudable, it still is a very risky focus for, say, a junior scholar. Um, and I have these conversations all the time um, for a junior scholar to get tenure, get promoted, to make a career and so forth. Yes, it's happened, but it's not happened terribly frequently. And there has been a very much a, a push for folks to go into more traditional areas, kind of as Gil was saying earlier. Um, and that's still you still have that. It's we're moving into an era where that's not so much the focus, but there's that still is very much something that you know, tenure promotion committees seem to struggle with, funders tend to struggle with, how do you, you know, do we actually do this? And what does that mean for your career and being able to be successful? Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that, Derek. I think you've highlighted a key piece, which I'm hoping we can flesh out some more too, as we go along in our hour and a half together is, um, you know, communicating about this work. Right? How do we talk about structural racism and its impact in its work and in, in work and health? Um, people, it becomes a very personal and sensitive topic. Um, and so, as scholars ourselves, how we talk about it is really important. Um, I'm going to ask Gilbert any uh, anything to, that you'd like to add to to what Derek shared. Yeah. So that was uh, Derek had a lot of amazing things to say, and just to add a couple of things. You know, right now, um, you know, there's talking about racism and health is pretty trendy, right? After, you know, COVID, you know, racism is, as a public health crisis, you know, NIH is getting on board and several other entities, funders and so forth. Um, and I, I think one thing I'd like to maybe talk about is the distinction and, and a definition of what structural racism is. Um, you know, so I see like, People using structural racism, institutional racism, you know, personal race, you know, personal discrimination, and so forth, uh, all the time. And I think it's useful to maybe start to unpack that a little bit. Um, so let me begin with institutional racism, which for me is really the you know racism that's perpetuated by social organizations like policing, education, healthcare, and so forth. And so for within each of those institutions, they do their thing that creates some kind of racial bias and outcome that may or may not exist with animus or not. But at the end of the day, we're talking about these individual entities. Now, structural racism to me is the connection across all of these institutions. So how does, for example, the judicial system back up the policing system? And how do they work with the education system together as a concerted unit uh, to essentially keep the racial inequality as equilibrium for all of us, right? And part of the way 
reason why I've been thinking about this is, you know, after the 1960s, you know, we had this, many of these actions that resulted from the civil rights movement, desegregation of hospitals, schools, and so forth. And we saw some minor victories, right? But in the work of Derek Bell, they slid into irrelevance, right? As racial patterns just kind of went back to these dominant forms of oppression that we have. And it's because we focus on interventions, civil rights interventions on specific institutions without thinking about the connections across these institutions. So if we're going to make, in my mind, some headway towards long-lasting structural changes, then we really need to attend to the entire structure of how various institutions play back up with one another, how they how one institution picks up the work of another. So, you know, uh, if you look at Michelle Alexander's work, talking about the new Jim Crow being mass incarceration, you know, we've in some ways made illegal segregation in the form of housing, but we've essentially just resegregated people into prisons, right? So for me, it's really thinking about these connections um, and how can we understand, conceptualize, theorize, and intervene on these interventions to get at the structure rather than just the institutions. Although don't get me wrong, the institutional stuff we need to do more of as well, um, as well as the interpersonal stuff. So even though, yeah, <laughs> Like I'm not focusing on microaggressions and all that stuff right now. We still need to do some more work on that as well. But really, if you're asking me like where the frontier is, it's really thinking about these connections across institutions. We can start to borrow information and techniques from social work, network analysis, for example, system science uh, methods, and, and you know, borrow from uh, bringing in computer scientists, for example, and so forth. And so uh, that's a few things I'd like to build on. But, excellent groundwork that Derek put out. Great. Thank you for, thank you. You know, as you're talking about systems, and I'm thinking about sort of the outer context in implementation science, we often think in implementation science when we're implementing a new um, evidence-based intervention, working with community and thinking about systems, it can quickly become overwhelming, right? There's so many intersections, and of course, intersectionality is at play as well. I'm wondering if any of our panelists has some advice for our implementation scientists or behavioral interventionists who are sitting in the audience and wondering how can I start to begin to tackle all of these things? It's quite overwhelming. Um, and I think acknowledging the interconnectedness, of course, is key. But at the end of the day, as investigators, we also want to think about sort of what's the pragmatic approach to start to tackle some of these pieces. And I'm going to open that up to everyone. So please jump in. Great. Um Happy to start, but definitely I look forward to hearing from my colleagues here. Me, I'm going to start from suggesting something that I've suggested to students and colleagues for a long time, which is as opposed to starting with trying to understand how do you get from the independent variable, if you will, of structural racism to the outcome of some kind of cancer disparity, it may make more sense from a pragmatic standpoint to actually start with the outcome and work your way backwards to try to better understand which pathways and mechanisms you're actually testing and which ones are modifiable and then how to actually intervene through that. And so to think through the pathways sort of backwards, yes, we're going to need to intervene from both ends, but, you know, sort of with a, a, a playing on, you know, Fran Baum's uh, nutcracker approach, but I think for the sake of thinking about it from implementation science standpoint, I would start working backwards and think through where do you actually see the most the most important sort of points to intervene from those standpoints and how are you actually going to do it and how are you going to show that that's the most or argue that that's the most effective place to intervene. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you for that advice. And I'm going to go to Valerie, um, you know, given your work as an interventionist. Um, and also an implementation scientist. I'm wondering if you have anything else to add to that um, in terms of how we can more explicitly apply in uh, a lens of structural racism to, racism to our IS work. Um, are there any recommendations in your work too, or any blind spots that we aren't thinking about in our field? Sure, and I noticed that my name was on that little question. <laughs> I thought oh, this is going to be a hard one. This panel is great because it's making me really make these connections that I feel like 
to start in my response, I would have to emphasize again what Derek and Gil said. You know, in the 90s and early 2000s, if you were in school of public health, you were not encouraged to study racism. That was not what NIH was funding. That was not what, you know, that was, it wasn't even a valid measure really. So as, as a, you know, junior scholar, my focus was on the systems and the structures and how they contributed to the poor health that indigenous populations uh, experienced. And I, and I think that I want to say, I want to emphasize that because there's a, there's a, a huge gap in scholars that know how to actually measure this and how to research this. Um, and as we move forward in understanding the impacts of structural racism, there's this great need for ways to assess this and measure it. So in, in my work, I would say that as an interventionist, you know, we were always starting with the reality post-apocalyptic colonization. You know, we are now in a reality that is the result of forced relocation and removal to reservations. So all of these diet-related diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, all of these all of these pieces are the result of lack of knowledge of our traditional food systems, um, you know, cultural genocide. These types of realities were the what what we were doing our work within. And so, for me, implementation science really offered a space where we could incorporate that reality into our solutions, into our interventions. So, you know, we didn't so much measure the impact of these pieces, um, but we incorporated traditional indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing within our interventions for the focus of restoration and reconnection. And so, I think there's now a drive to to really assess the um, the outcomes of some of the historical trauma and the current um, realities of what folks experience. I think our focus was always in how do we adapt the evidence-based interventions, which to me are just a starting point, a framework to the lived reality of our historical and cultural context. And that's why I was drawn to implementation science because it opened up that space for us to put our context within it and then move forward. Valerie, thanks so much for sharing your experience and the work that you're doing. One of the things I'm hearing back is in the community that you're working um, with, um, structural racism and historical trauma are such a core foundation of the context that truly is integrated into the experience of the community that you're partnering with. And so that's one example. And but in other examples, you know, and it also sounds like you have a lens for which integrating that um, sort of uh, experience of the community and having the community experiences drive the research question are really also helping in terms of identifying what is the right approach as you're incorporating structural racism and that experience into your work. Um, Rachel, I was wondering if you could please also comment on this question too, and, and maybe you can, you started to share some examples um, with the work that you've done uh, for breast cancer survivors, but thought was wondering if you had any other thoughts on to add about um, any recommendations um, or opportunities for implementation scientists and in integrating structural racism? Absolutely, and I think it builds off some of the, the points that have been made, but I wanna highlight a couple because I think 
and implementation science, you know, many of us have been driven to the field because of the promise of addressing and promoting health equity. But when you look at all the frameworks and all the methods and all the strategies and interventions we use, most of, most of them do not have that explicit equity lens. And most of them have not been developed with the goal of you know, reducing inequities or even the goal of addressing structural racism. That is, that's not common. So I think that there are a lot of ways we need to think about in terms of making this much more foundational. So it's not just an add on, you know, I worry sometimes people, you know, because it is now a hot topic that people are going to kind of say, okay, now I'm assessing that I've assessed structural racism. Let me move on. It has to be done in a way that's, you know, with care and with humility and that it's actually thinking about the consequences of structural racism and the mechanisms through which it operates. So I think there's a couple suggestions that I can make. And one is really thinking about, you know, putting on my intervention hat. What are the interventions that we are even trying to um, partner with communities and clinical settings to implement? And Derek and I have had this conversation a number of times. A lot of the ones that we are implementing, you know, have in our, you know, from our evidence based um, databases and toolkits, you know, again, haven't centered or looked at addressing structural racism. So there might be ways that we can think about adaptations to address social determinants of health or to address structural racism. But I, I actually think that we need to be working much earlier and partnering much earlier with intervention developers in that process to help inform that with an implementation lens. And I think we really need to rethink and prioritize much more upstream policy level, multi-level, and multi-sector interventions. I think if we really want to make an impact on the structural determinants and the social determinants of health that are shaped by structural racism, we have to be thinking about um, going outside the healthcare setting and thinking about collaborating with education and criminal justice reform um, and housing as just a couple examples. Um, and I think that um, the other thing we really have to be thinking about is what are those community defined, those community led interventions that are already out there that are being delivered that maybe haven't been identified or tested as gold standard, but are already accepted by the community. And so again, partnering with communities to understand how those can better be delivered. So I think we really need to think about expanding what we're counting as our evidence-based interventions. And there's a whole literature, you know, David Williams and the Bailey, Lisa Cooper, many people have done work for 20 to 30 years identifying an evidence base of policies and programs to address structural racism. So we need to think about those as what we should actually be implementing um, to make change. I also think in terms of our contextual frameworks, you know, implementation science is all about context, you know, that's a huge focus of our work. But again, you know, as we've discussed, the focus has often been often been on that organizational context, right? Things like leadership and financial support. And we really have not captured community context, social context, or a lot of these structural determinants. And that really matters, right? The frameworks that we use have huge implications for what get me gets measured and for what we actually consider in terms of our understanding of why these inequities exist and why inequitable implementation exists. So it, it, we have incomplete or inaccurate explanations, right? If we're missing an assessment of structural, determin structural racism and its impact. So I think that's critical and I think that's should be something that we are now routinely doing as part of our contextual assessment, as part of part of our formative assessment, as we go in and plan for our implementation strategies and our evidence based interventions. And there's been some amazing work. I can just highlight a couple, you know, Michelle Allen work at Minnesota. She recently did an adaptation, bringing a critical race lens to the CIFR model, the consolidated framework for implementation research that interrogates questions about how our race and racism operating. So that's the kind of work that's really going to take us, I think, informed by this long scholarship in this area, but applied and contextualized to implementation science in a way that elevates it and that is meaningful. I think that's critical. Um, and I have lots of other ideas about implementation strategies that I can come back to, but those are some of the key points I want to make related to interventions. Um, and I really appreciate the, the specificity of the language because I think, you know, we have tended to lump structural racism in with social determinants of health. And I think that this is a moment where people are finally naming it. And I think that the implications for how we would address the underlying systems and how it shapes institutional racism are quite different than how we might influence the individual social determinants of health. So I think that that's 
an opportunity for our field to be really explicit in naming and taking action around structural racism. Thanks so much, Rachel. And I appreciate that acknowledgement around naming and definitions. And Derek mentioned earlier too, a question about what we mean by equity. And Gilbert has also, there's different types of structural racism. Um, and then also when measuring impact that Valerie um, um, mentioned, you know, we do need um, good measurement, right? And implementation science is a set of tools, methods, and approaches. So we do have a, a question from um, the audience about any recommendations around measures. Um, and as you're thinking about that too, um, you know, if you have any suggestions for investigators and sort of the lens and, and thinking about those measures and uh, metrics and any suggestions, um, we can also collate those at NCI and share them over the chat as well. Can I respond to the last thing you said, um, but from a slightly different angle? Um, and I'm not an implementation science person, so forgive my ignorance, but um, you know, so I, I'm, I've been, you know, in departments where, you know, they have other titles like, you know, health education and so forth. And there's inevitably a sequence of, you know, theory, planning, evaluation, and so forth. Um, and in all the schools I've been in, including right now at UCLA, one of the things that I've really struggled with that I think would be amazing is to update a lot of the theoretical models you know, have a guiding textbook that really centers equity, racism, oppression, um, rather than just having it sort of as an off chapter. Um, you know, like we still, I know some of the classes still use, you know, the NCI theories at a glance that was produced, what, in the 1980s or something like that? That's what, I still have one on my bookshelf. <laughs> you know, and the glance textbook and all those things, they're great, but they're not about the issues that we're really talking about today. You can't health belief model away structural racism. Um, and that's one of the big struggles that I, I know I've had in our classes, you know, like, you know, we, in our theory class, people get really jazzed about, oh, how do we think about inequity? How do we think about racism? And then they get into the planning class and then suddenly it's like, oh, it's all about the individual behavior change. And then the, many of the evaluation textbooks are also kind of defaulting into that same you know, modus operandi. So I don't know if there is something already out there. I mean, there are certainly books, you know, like the one that, you know, Derek's been editing along with Chandra Ford and many other friends and colleagues, but other than that, there's, it's pretty <laughs> some things, but I'd love to learn more if there is stuff out there. That's right. I think that might be the quote of the day for me. You can't help belief your way out of structural racism. That's that's totally right on. Um, any other thoughts from the panel? Because um, all of you have, I'm sure, thought about some of the measurement challenges and the framework challenges yeah. here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to speak to the measurement challenges. I'm going to leave that for Gil, since I know that's really much more his area. But I do think building on um, what both Valerie and, and Rachel said, you know, the idea of focusing on, I think one of the things that, again, as, as a newly adopted implementation scientist, um, so thank you for that, April, um, <laughs> the, the transferability of interventions to new settings is part of what I think we're looking at. So it's never going to be that you can take and plop an intervention that was effective in one place and plop it into somewhere else. There may be processes, there's theory that needs to, that you can think about and contextual factors that you'd have to see how it applies, but really focusing on the what works for whom and in what situations and really focusing on the process evaluation part. And as, and as Valerie said, you know, the formative work that it really is the foundation for how you decide what gets applied, what gets you know, implemented, how you frame it, how you collaborate with community to come to some common understanding of that is really going to be essential, not just to the effectiveness of the actual intervention, but to its potential sustainability over time. And I think being able to think through those things from the beginning, we've been saying that forever as far as the interventions, we need to think about its sustainability from the beginning. But this is really an opportunity to think about that. And again, with communities, not necessarily for them. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. We have a we have a question from the audience, and this is for Valerie and Rachel. 
Um, you spoke about integrating the lived experiences of marginalized groups um, in, your, in interventions and in your work. Um, so related to that point, um, Derek, that you made, when it comes to scale and repl replicability and thinking about sustainability, thinking about the groups that you work with, they're not monoliths. Um, how do you account for that with regard to replication and scale? So taking what works in one racial ethnic community or urban or rural um, and then bringing it to another, what are some of the recommendations you might have? Uh, I can start. Um, so I think, yeah, this there's always this interesting tension, right, in both intervention science and implementation science about adapting to local context, how much do you adapt, and this tension with scale and scale up. So a lot of times implementation scientists think about it as like, are there these core elements that need to be in place and those will remain. And there's a lot of discussion now around prioritizing function, the function of those core elements of a program over the form. So that form might look different across different communities, right? Based on context, based on experiences of discrimination or who they trust, what which institutions are trustworthy to them, or what clinicians are. Um, so the the form of it might look look different, but the function of it in terms of the mechanisms it's addressing, or how it's maybe addressing issues of distrust or social determinants of health or structural racism might be the same. So that's one way that I have thought about it as I've thought about this tension between adaptation and scale. But again always for me letting the community partners drive that right like they are the ones that are going to know what is going to work on the ground much better than me so i can be kind of a sounding board in terms of the science of it but they know kind of what it should look like on the ground so i think that that that's a continuing discussion and there's no kind of one size fits approach one size fits all approach on how to handle that but that's one one way i've thought about it great thank you rachel valerie anything to add to that I'm trying to hold seven different thoughts at once. I was thinking, I was thinking, wouldn't it be amazing on Derek's comment if when we design how health, health structural racism fits into these implementation science models, it does have community input in terms of how that manifests and how that feels and exists in a community environment. Um, instead of these textbook theories that I think we were, you know, we were trained in. Um, yeah, I remember, sorry, when Larry Green taught Precede Proceed by colleagues, it makes sense when you explain it, <laughs> you know, but um, no, I think, I think that Rachel's comment is really excellent. I think evidence-based interventions are a great gift to us. I change them in terms of form and I change them in terms of delivery. I think there's a lot of freedom and flexibility in how these EBIs can be delivered. And I think that we often overestimate what needs to be changed, um, as surprising as that may be. Many of these EBI components actually are can be relevant in really diverse communities um, as long as the process of their implementation is honored um, you know according to local preferences and um, I think most communities in the intervention work that I've done value the 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 science of the EBIs um, but they don't want to have to trade um, local um, values over, over Western scientific methods. And I found that there can be an integration of um, local knowledge and processes with the EBIs. So, you know, in my experience, it's not always as challenging as it might appear. That being said, um, you know, I think it's especially, especially important for communities of color, marginalized communities to have EBIs because, um, and to implement them in ways that are, you know, adapted to the context. Because if not, 
we keep reinventing the wheel and we keep you know we're not we're not getting the latest interventions we're not getting the latest science there's that gap that exists um in terms of what is shared broadly with the population and that's the whole reason implementation science was born was to fill that gap and so um that's that's why I think EBIs are valuable, even if they came out of um, external, non-community um, origins. Great, thank you so much. You. I have another question on uh, from the chat, and Valerie, I'm pulling this one up because of what you just mentioned about speaking with, com uh, you know, working with communities, talking to them about key components or key ingredients in an EBI, and then also talking to like perhaps the researcher who developed the intervention. And then it brought me, th got me thinking about different stakeholders. And we kind of touched a little bit on this earlier in our time together about how this work can be really challenging and the language about structural racism. And it brings in some um, emotional valence. Um, and, um, and, and currently right now too, um, because it's such a hot topic and there is some backlash in the media and in policy around um, structural racism and critical race theory. I was wondering if the panelists have, um, and this is also a question from our um, audience, how, um, what are your suggestions in talking to talking with uh, key stakeholders who you're working with about some of these issues of structural racism and why it might be important to acknowledge it in the work and with the communities that we that we serve. Do you have any suggestions for working with these stakeholders to acknowledge the historical impact of trauma on racial groups, um, given that our work will have a larger and, and a desired broader impact beyond academic research? I'm happy to jump in and start. Um, so let me start with something that is, uh, I'll say, somewhat controversial because I've had this this um, issue with colleagues or, or disagreement. I'll, I'll say, um, structure. If you think about the concept of structural racism or just the terms, they're not exactly things that fit normally into our regular conversation. They don't necessarily. They're not. They're very high level, abstract sort of concepts that there's very much a contentious, you know, there's no, you know, common agreement about when we say structural, what does that mean if you're talking to people just on the street and much less in our professional world? And certainly when you talk about racism and just the, as you, as you said, April, the emotional baggage that comes with that, that that is, you know, challenging in and of itself. And I know a lot of the trainings that, you know, try to provide a foundation and they'll provide a definition that one of the things in, in my work that we found is it's very difficult to even when you give people a definition and say, OK, in the context of this, suspend what you knew before and use this definition. It's very difficult for them to do that if darn near, if not darn near possible. So I think the, the point I'm getting to is. Sometimes racism is not the best. The terminology may not be the best communication tool to get to having these conversations that you may have to talk about as other folks, John Powell did, did a, 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 some great work years ago when he was at the Kerman Institute, not that he's not doing great work now, but it's, it's he talked about the idea of think, using things like opportunity structures when you had the, um, and those things that are, that are differential opportunities for people to be healthy, for people to be well. Like you have to find, it's not again, and even the um, Commission for a Healthier America, I think is what it was called that RWJ did, um, in around 2008 that uh, David Williams was definitely a, a big part of not led, I believe that that initiative where they were trying to come up with um, metaphors and other sort of things that would help to sort of break down the, the barriers of being able to have conversations because you knew that there were certain terms that were kind of, you know, you know, hot buttons that were, you know, that were speaking to different audiences. So, you know, if you use different euphemisms and so forth for different groups, that those things were going to speak only to those and it would turn off other people. So the point is, I think you can, we have to really think through, you know, the, the importance and the benefit of doing that. Now, having said that, I do understand the, the other point that in some context, labeling, naming racism, as Dr. Tamara Jones would say, 
is a fundamental and essential to the work that we do. So it's not to say never do it, it's to say be, be, we need to be judicious and thoughtful about when we do it and when we don't. And I'm certainly never going to disagree with her, but it's like those are the things that we have to kind of grapple with is when and how do you do that work? And, and is it going to facilitate or be too big of an obstacle for people to jump over for them to be willing to even engage with you further? Or are they going to completely shut down? Great. Thank you, Derek. Um, Gilbert, and, and some points that I'll add to that. Yeah, if that's go okay. ahead. Yes, yes, Rachel. One way that this has played out a little bit is talking a little bit more with my community partners about the consequences of structural racism being things around power and decision making and resources, because those conversations come up when you're partnering with communities, particularly in a grant or research context. And I think one kind of aha moment that I had uh, with those partners were around issues. There's a paper that, that came out last year on trust and mistrust and de-implementation and adaptation of changing screening guidelines. And um, the experience that they really communicated about how disempowering it can be for communities when new guidelines come out and they're expected to immediately kind of adapt and, and go with whatever the new guidelines are with the recognition that the guidelines probably were not developed and tested with them in mind. In this case, the breast cancer screening guidelines were not, and that they have actually more aggressive tumors at younger ages. So that, so the guidelines do not match the lived experience and the guidelines have not been developed and tested with them in mind. So that was kind of a point where it was like the, the roots of structural racism and how that played out in terms of their mistrust of guidelines coming from a medical system that has been predominantly white and has not uh, necessarily prioritize their health was kind of like an aha teaching moment, I think, for both of us where, um, but I don't think it is, it is always that apparent, but that for me was an example where, um, you know, that came up in dialogue with community partners and leaders. I would also add that, you know, one way that we worked on it, as we've said, um, the evidence of structural racism is everywhere. I mean, just take your pick on the outcomes. So we may not want to work directly on race for internal reasons that if we talk about race in this community, we won't be able to live side by side. But what we can intervene on is the fact that we don't have access to healthy food in this community. And we do have a grocery store, but the prices are jacked up for people of color. So we have to travel off the reservation to get healthy food and we can't afford to do that, make that trip. So those are the kinds of things that everybody knows that structural racism is at its core, but how it manifests is the way that we tackle the issue in our interventions. And I don't think I don't think it's hard to argue with some of the evidence. I mean, in terms of this community doesn't have access to healthy food. That's what this intervention focuses on. Great, thank you. I have another question from the audience, but before I transition to that one, I just wanted to remind people that you can continue to put questions in the chat. I have quite a list to go through, so I hope I get, can get through all of them. But also Sarah Bernal has been posting some resources and links that have been mentioned in the discussion today. So please take a look at those. We're getting a lot of questions about measurement. So I'm gonna go back to measurement one more time. Um, the question from the, our audience is, um, you know, there's a desire to create met metrics um, that reflect whether or not organizations, so sort of at the organizational level, um, what they are doing um, to reduce structural racism within their settings. So uh, for the panelists, are there any um, considerations you would recommend when trying to pick an organizational measure um, of structural ra racism? Um, and then are there any other indicators to also consider? Um, because if we can't operationalize this, that measure or I define it with community at the organizational level, are there other metrics that you might consider that would go hand in hand with a measure of structural racism? I'll just put a plug in for one measure in particular um, that I think is very relevant to academic institutions. So, um, 
AJ Jackson um, has done some amazing work that I think is published in the Journal of Ethics, which is around developing a measure of institutional racism for academic medical centers to use. Um, so I would highly recommend that you take a look at that. And I think for me, some of the biggest compendiums in terms of structural racism exist in this book in the appendix by Rebecca Israel Cross. Um, there's an amazing compendium. There's a great review by Gruss and, and authors, G R O O S. Um, we have a paper on structural racism and implementation science that lists all those measures and has specific references if you're interested in that. So hopefully Sarah Bernal can put that in the chat, but. They are out there. There are there are measures, and I know Gilbert Gee is an expert in yes, that. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, those are great references, and I highly recommend them. Maybe a couple of things just to throw in. Um, I'll give you an example from what I think is we need more data systems that are designed to measure inequality. And a good example comes from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which mandates that lending institutions collect data on race, gender, and so forth in when, when people go to buy a, you know, get a mortgage for a house. Um, that was designed from community efforts arising, uh, that culminated in an act in 1975, so that, you know, communities could get equity so that they could desegregate, um, you know, neighborhoods. Uh, we don't have a humda-like mechanism in healthcare, education, and so forth. But without actually collecting data, you know, it, it, it's one thing to kind of create measures post hoc, but it's actually even better to collect primary data on inequity as it's arising from institutional practices. So we need definitely to do that. Um, then we need to, you know, be more clever and, you know, borrow from a lot of techniques um, uh, that, you know, Rachel, I just mentioned, there's a lot of stuff that's published. Um, you know, and ways to adapt existing measures of things like residential segregation in uh, Gini index and index of dissimilarity and things like that that could be adapted. And finally, there are also methods that are more primary, such as audit methods uh, using paired testing methodology uh, that, you know, uh, the HUD, you know, Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Justice uh, has been used for law enforcement purposes for many decades. Um, and finally, thinking about what exactly are we wanting to measure at the organizational level? Um, as many of you may know, thinking about discrimination, you can think of it with animus, prejudicial kind of intent in mind, or in absence of prejudicial intent. As I forget, it might have been Derek who mentioned before, when, when you talk to um, a lot of people about, and you just say the word racism, most of them are thinking about you know, most people will say, oh, hate crimes, we're not doing hate crimes, there's nothing going on here. Um, I think that was part of what kind of blew up at JAMA, if you were following that a couple months ago. Um, but, you know, racism is way more about hate crimes, and it doesn't necessarily result, it doesn't necessarily require that people have prejudicial thoughts um, in their minds. It can just happen as a way of this is how we do business and how we do business has been set up for decades that perpetuates inequality. Um, but, you know, we're, we can't be bothered to kind of look at the history or I, maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but, you know, we don't probe enough of the history of what we do as part of day-to-day -day practice uh, that maintains the inequalities that we have. And so if we start thinking also that there are measures of things that don't require us to have a definition of racism that has requires prejudice, um, then that can start freeing us up into being more creative with measures as well. Great. That's great advice. So we have some, um, a cluster of questions more from the standpoint of um, some of your advice as leaders in this field and for junior investigators and scholars who are interested in um, doing scholarship and science that's very similar to the path that the four of you have taken. And the question is around what advice do you have for um, behavioral scientists, for implementation scientists who want to incorporate structural racism and social determinants um, of health work into, into their scholarship? Um, what advice do you have? And we can start off with Valerie. <laughs> 
what advice do we have for implementation scholars who want to incorporate structural racism in their work? Yes, or a behavioral scientist. So researchers who are going into this area and how can we better include and incorporate structural racism or social determinants uh, lens into our work? Right. I was just thinking about about that actual question. You know, it's it's definitely a new day from when I was in school and really learning this this work. And I think about junior scholars now and how they really want to specifically name and study what we were always encouraged just to walk around. And I think there's incredible power in that. And I seek out junior scholars who know how to measure these things. And I think it's incredibly powerful to give um, to bear witness to the experiences that have been so minimized by, um, you know, for so long. And so that that's the value I see in it. I mean, in terms of being able to actually measure it and study it. Um, and, you know, I think that for me, that's how I've started to do it is to actually um, work more closely with junior scholars who do have more expertise than than I do. And um, definitely in a community based participatory research approach, there's room and space for the lived experience of communities to be integrated across all stages of the research process. So that lens informs everything from the research question all the way through the evaluation and how we're measuring what we're measuring and how we disseminate it and share our story. So I think CBPR is a powerful approach to the research process for me that allows space for that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and Derek, do you have any recommendations for junior scholars? I do. Um, one, be specific and clear about what you actually mean. Be able to operationalize the concepts as opposed to just using it as a term that you, you know, I'll, I'll have people say, well, I want to study structural racism. What exactly do you mean by that? And, you know, so are you and how are you thinking about it operating as it relates to the outcome and population that you're thinking about? So this is where the intersectional approach that you were talking about really becomes important. Being precise about when you're thinking about the nuances of racialization to groups that are not necessarily considered races, the group, you know, looking at some of the specificity of you know, anti-Asian um, racism versus anti-Black racism versus the way you racialize racial, um, religious minorities to, you know, Latinx populations. So being precise about that and how it actually works. Are you thinking about it shaping, you know, population risk and vulnerability, stress exposure, individual behavior, like what exactly the ability to cope with stress? So being really clear about how you're thinking it's going to affect whatever outcome it can't just be that you were able to sort of throw the terms around. You've got to be really thoughtful. The other thing I would say is really make sure that you're well versed in the literature and that you understand what's out there before you go in there proposing um, something that that may already exist. The last thing I'll say, oh, sorry, I said I said two, but the third thing I'll say is um, to be really thoughtful about potentially including mixed methods or qualitative approaches and not assume that we actually can quantitatively measure everything that we don't completely know yet. Because part of the assumption of quantitative is you actually know the term, know the things and know how to measure it. Um, I think one of the things that the work on structural racism has taught us is we don't really know what we don't know. And we certainly don't know how to ask the question appropriately so that we can get the answer that is space valid and, and structurally valid as it relates to how we um, have valid measures of different outcomes. So, so does it sound like, um, you know, in, in listening to all of you um, talk about some of these things and measurement, it keeps coming up. 
there isn't any one measure that we're recommending, but it's more working with the communities and understanding uh, their perspective and really being clear, working together about how we're defining that um, and then working to identify what that measure might be. You know, Derek, when you had mentioned sort of, you kind of mentioned sort of this diversity and sort of the experiences of our the the diversity of our US population, different racial ethnic groups, and the experiences of structural racism can really vary from group to group. So how is it that if we were to make some momentum or build an evidence base around structural racism, and we have these measurement challenges still today, we have some tools that we could potentially use to get to that place, working with community, taking taking a mixed methods approach, taking a transdisciplinary perspective and pulling from different areas of science. If the four of you had some sort of like prediction or you know, some key ingredients, what are the key leverage points that we need to make in the next five, six years in order to move this area of science forward? What would that be? And I'm gonna pause a minute so you can think about it um, because there are so many different potential exciting new areas to go also areas where I think that as a field, we can learn more about and also integrate different voices into that conversation. So just taking a minute, what are some of the key pieces that you'd like our field to, to really consider and make movement on in the next five to six years? I think what's come up for me is that we have to acknowledge the history of racism that exists within medicine and within our field. And if there, we're really going to move away and beyond that, we have to change not just our tools that we're using, but we have to change our orientation. We have to change our approach to research as it currently exists. These are um, traditionally transa transactional experiences and communities exist within relational experiences and within relationships. And I think if we try to be researchers using new tools without a fundamental acceptance of the racism that's inherent within our discipline, within the orientation that informs our tools, that we're we're not going to make much progress. Thank you, thank you for for naming that and putting a voice to that. I think he, uh, Gilbert was going to jump in, and then Rachel. I was just going to say, uh, and I and I. By the way, I agree with what Valerie said 100%. Um, to really think about the study of race, racism, inequality as a specialization where you just need to bring in an expert on that. It's, you know, some days we're like, hey, I need to do, I need somebody who knows a lot about focus groups and methodology in that respect. I'm going to bring in a consultant or a co -fi on that, or I need somebody who is an expert on whatever, you know. Um, uh, mammograms, but same thing for race and, and racism and other kinds of inequality. You know, bring in experts when you realize that you don't quite have what you need to do to do the work. Great. And Rachel? Yeah, and I agree to these same points. I think that it definitely it's not something we want to rush into as a field. I think that we really have to have the humility to recognize that, you know, people have dedicated their lives to studying these issues and, you know, it's not the kind of thing where we're going to be able to um, just kind of add it to our list of measures. Like we really have to, I think, absorb and elevate some of the work that has been done in the field and understand it. And I think part of that is some of the work around you know, Chandra Ford's work and Collins Aaron Bua around uh, public health critical race practice and what that brings to how we approach our research, right? It's not one size fits all. It causes us to ask questions that we might not usually ask. 
And I think we also have to have kind of like Valerie was saying, humility in our community engagement, right? In terms of how we're coming in as scientific experts to the community, right? There has to be humility in how I think we're engaging around that. And then I, the last point I would make is that I think we often think about structural racism as kind of outside the scope of implementation science. I hear that a lot from colleagues that this is not something that I can address in my five year grant. But I would really think about, I often go back to examples like um, the ways that race specific algorithms are operating within our institutions that are informed by biases that are shaped by historical and structural racism and how that might bias the type of care. I think there's some great examples. The ACURE trial is one that comes to mind um, at UNC that again, really took a race specific approach. It did not take a colorblind approach. It was specifically tracking and understanding where and when the health inequities were arising and using a quality improvement approach to address that. Um, so I think that's the kind of like, that's the kind of work that we can do in implementation science that can start to address some of these mechanisms and how structural racism is playing out. So not to be deterred that this isn't something that we can't do uh, in implementation science, I think is something important for us to grapple with. We all have a role. Um, so, and Derek, anything, I, I, I want to give you the last word on this. Um, I, I think as far as sort of next steps, both in terms of measurement and intervention, I think it goes back to being, I think going forward to me, it would be, you know, being thoughtful, precise, and explicit about where do things work for whom and in what context. That is clearly part of the the framing of implementation science yet and particularly in this measurement space we keep trying to make it where we're just homogenizing i think you know again that that's sort of one part i think to what a, to a point gill made earlier again people sort of debate about the the framing of structural racism versus racism and institutional racism i think breaking apart and looking at if what does racism look like in the healthcare institution in public health institution and in population health and how that's related to or different from how it's how it's affecting education, employment, and those kind of systems is going to be critical to answering the question about how do you measure these factors? Because how it's going to operate within a particular system is going to have to be you know system specific, and that's part of it. So I think being able to move that work forward is going to be really critical. Uh, to, to be able to move that work forward is going to be uh, require us to be thoughtful and precise about what we mean and where we're talking about. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful um, responses to all the questions and this great discussion. It's been such an honor and it's already 3.30 and we've run out of time very quickly. Um, but I just want to acknowledge all of you as panelists. Um, for sharing your expertise and your time with all of us. Um, and I also just want to, um, and in my final one more remark, I just want to pull one question from the um, audience. The audience, one of the members of the audience asked us, how can we maintain the current momentum and interest in addressing inequality and structural racism? And what I would say to that, and I'm, I, I'm going to guess, go out on a limb here and say my panelists would also agree with this, is that all of you keeping your interests, asking the right questions, continuing your scholarship in this area, whether you're a junior scholar or a senior scholar, is going to keep that momentum um, in addressing inequality and structural racism um, in implementation science and behavioral science um, and in our, in our work and in our, our lived experiences in our lives. So um, continue that work. Uh, and thank you so much again to all of our panelists and to all of you for your attention. I'm gonna toss it over to Sarah Bernal for some closing announcements. Wonderful, thanks so much, April. On behalf of NCI, I'd like to extend our thanks to the thoughtful remarks from our panel, April, our moderator, Alyssa and Emily for providing ASL interpretation throughout and to all of those who attended, asked a question and engaged with us on this important topic. An archive of today's session will be made available shortly on our website. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you in September for the third session in this series on advancing health equity through implementation science focused on engagement science. You will be directed to that registration page in the coming weeks. You may disconnect at this time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Take care. Be well.